Uh, well, thank you everyone uh, for joining the US Asia Law Institute this morning. Uh, and I would like to welcome our speaker today, Teresa Fallon. Uh, she is the founding uh, founder and director of the Center for Russia Europe Asia Studies, also known as Prius. Uh, it's in Brussels. Teresa is concurrently a member of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. This is known to many of us as CSCAP. Um, it's, uh, I, I take it she's part of the, Euro the EU Council. Um, and she's an adjunct professor at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. Uh, Teresa was educated at the University of Chicago, Loyola University, and the London School of Economics and Political Scientists, Science. So I also may not be a familiar face to many of you. Um, I am Peter Dutton, a senior fellow at the US Asia Law Institute and also an adjunct professor of law at NYU Law School. Uh, I teach there with uh, Professor Jerry Cohen, whom uh, all of you know, I'm sure. Um, and we teach a course called Chinese Attitudes Towards International Law. Uh, I'm hoping very much that some of our students, in fact, uh, are, are joining us in the audience today. Perhaps we'll get some questions for them. Um, I'm also a professor of strategic studies at the US Naval War College, where I'm a member of the China Maritime Studies Institute. Uh, and I'm currently a visiting scholar at MIT Strategic Studies Program. So I'll be moderating the program today uh, in conversation with Teresa. Uh, before we get started, I've got uh, a couple of housekeeping things that I've got to, uh, to, to, to help you with. Um, this event, as I'm sure you have noticed, uh, is being recorded. Uh, we uh, will be posting the video at the usali.org website. Uh, although this process does take a few weeks usually to, uh, to accomplish, so uh, be on the lookout for it if you're interested, but it could be a little while. Um, and uh, I also have a small teaser for you. Uh, the next Zoom talk uh, will be uh, hosted also by the US Asia Law Institute on Friday, May 22nd. Um, so it's not next Wednesday as usual, it will be a week from Friday. And it will start at 10 a.m. Eastern time. The speaker will be Sam Sachs, who is, uh, who she, she leads um, New America's Data and Great Power Competition Project. Uh, and she'll be talking about the US-China technology relationship and the politics of data. Um, you can register for this event at the usali.org uh, website. Um, Teresa Fallon has titled her talk this morning, uh, intriguingly, uh, M Butterfly 2.0 the evolution of EU-China relations. Um, she'll be offering a few open, opening comments. Then she and I will have a conversation about the issues uh, she raised in her talk. And after that, we'll open it up uh, broadly for questions from the audience. If you would like to submit a question, please click on the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that says Q&A and type in your question and I'll do my best to, uh, to follow along. So, all right, welcome, Teresa. Um, Please tell us about your intriguing uh, title for today's talk. First of all, thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's such a huge honor. I wish I could be there with you, all of you, but I'm delighted that we're able to meet in, by, via Zoom. So the, the title, M Butterfly 2.0, was inspired by the, the real story of a spy scandal between a French diplomat and a Chinese uh, spy who was also a, a female impersonator who, who did Chinese opera. So the, the male um, French diplomat Bernard Borsico met uh, Xi Pei Pei Pu at a uh, French ambassador's uh, Christmas party way back in 1964. So they kept the relationship for 20 years uh, to keep them going. Uh, they even, uh, the, the Chinese opera star pretended to have, to have a child and uh, strung him along for 20 years in a romantic relationship where he really didn't believe that he was a man, but that he, that uh, his uh, lover was a, actually a woman. So they moved back to France in, in 1984, I believe. And then it would, they were arrested one year later uh, because he had been spying and all this evidence had accrued. So when it was uh, uncovered, when he was in prison, that he, this person who had pretended to be his uh, lover for all these years, was really a man, he tried to commit suicide. Bernard, uh, the French uh, diplomat, tried to commit suicide. So it's such a fantastic story and hard to believe in, in many respects, 
that it turned into a Broadway show and, and also a film. But I use that as a metaphor sometimes to describe the kind of the current relations with Europe and China. I think it's a, an appropriate metaphor. So I'll start with last Friday was the 45th anniversary of EU China relations. And when I speak about EU, I mean the European Union. And of course, it's not a monolith. There are 27 member states. So every member state has their own viewpoints and ideas on how to have trade with China. So it tends to be like the, the lowest common denominator of the entire group. But let's start um, with what I would describe as a honeymoon period in EU-China relations. So after uh, the Iraq war in 2003, as a way to kind of show that they, the Europeans were upset with the United States, they kind of turned towards China and they, they announced a comprehensive strategic partnership in 2003. So the two main issues that China wanted out of the relationship was to lift the arms embargo and also to uh, be considered a market economy status, which would give it different uh, trading benefits within the EU. So now it's 2020, 2020 they still don't have either one of those things. So this, this uh, honeymoon period from 2003 lasted actually quite a short period of time when the, the Chinese understood that Europe wasn't going to be an independent poll, and that when they tried to cultivate the Europeans to actually lift the arms embargo that was in place since 1989 after the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, when that failed, the, the Chinese were kind of disappointed in the Europeans and realized that they had, that the US had influence with the Europeans. So that would be the, the honeymoon period. Then I would say there was a growing awareness. Uh, from there, there was a slow, slow uh, downward spiral. So. Uh, China wanted market access, so with uh, similar to what happened with the U.S., once China joined the WTO, there was a lot more trade between EU and China. This also included technology transfer, and uh, over time we saw with the 2008 um, financial crisis, China increased their investments dramatically in Europe in various businesses, as well as strategic infrastructure. So we also see this happening with Piraeus. It's a Greek port in the Mediterranean. And over time, China has uh, increased their investments there. And it's performing quite well. It's uh, a very modern port. And uh, let's move up from there, from uh, the, the investment in Piraeus to then uh, the turning point, I would say, was China's 2020, uh, announcement of the 2025 strategy, how they want it made in China 2025. And Europeans, especially Germany, who has, is the biggest European trade partner of China, started to feel more concerned because China was seen more as a competitor, not just a customer. So we saw in 2016, there was a sale of KUKA. And KUKA was a major robotics company, one of the top robotics companies in Germany. And they had this ad with the robotics arm playing the, the world's leading ping pong player. So the Chinese bought this company. And we know with the civil military uh, cooperation within China, we see German engineers actually designing things for the People's Liberation Army. So this also causes some friction in transatlantic relations when German companies are bought by the Chinese and working on a very advanced technology that the PLA also has access to. So. Um, so also, Europe found themselves competing with China in areas where they traditionally had more influence, for example, in Africa. So European aid or projects actually had a lot of strings attached, good governance, transparency requirements, whereas China didn't have that. So we see uh, a loss of influence uh, by, the, by Europe in Africa. And last year, for example, with the UN um, FAO uh, campaign for the Europeans had a, a French candidate for this position. And if you think about it, you have 27 votes at the UN, plus you have some smaller countries like Andorra. So altogether, you can get 31, 32 votes possibly in the UN, considering even some uh, possible accession states uh, from Central and Eastern Europe that will vote with Europe in order to, to please them. And even with this kind of guaranteed pool of votes, and even the US would vote to support a European candidate, China continues to win. And so we see that uh, Europe is losing a lot of influence in these multilateral institutions, which is part of their narrative that they're very active in multilateral institutions, and they're losing that influence to China. 
So we also saw uh, with the announcement of China's Belt and Road Initiative, all roads lead to Europe. And so at first Europe was a bit skeptical about this initiative, unclear really what it meant. So there's the overland part, the maritime part. And over time, uh, the announcement of the Arctic Silk Road as well as the digital Silk Road. So there are many Silk Roads that Europe has to, to uh, recognize and deal with, with China. Just prior to the announcement of China's Belt and Road Initiative was a new initiative announced one year previously called the 16 plus one. And this is a sub-regional grouping carved out of Central Eastern European 11 EU member states and five possible accession states, which also include Serbia. So Europe was very skeptical about this sub-regional grouping. Some called it a Trojan horse for China's influence. And over time, uh, we could see that these investments in the region actually did pay off. For example, in 2016, with the arbitral tribunal decision, uh, many expected Europe, which was a supporter of multilateralism and international norms and the rule of law, uh, would support the decision in 2016 in regard to Philippines versus China in regard to the Nine Dash Line. Instead, Europe was neutralized effectively. So Greece and Hungary blocked uh, the, the position on, on Europe. So because it's an organization that requires unanimity, all it takes is one country to, to block something. So, it was un so Europe was unable to support this very important uh, arbitral tribunal decision. So if I would, in my analysis, I would think, I see it as 2016 is a, a very key year. So Europe was blocked. This is something Russia was never able to do. So China effectively bought a statement, you could say, from Europe and blocked a policy that they did not like. So Europe uh, is a big trading zone. China likes that, but they also have a nuanced relationship with Europe. They, don't want, it, they want to have enough leverage to stop any sort of rules or regulations that they don't like. And then uh, we're seeing a lot more concern about, I talked about the digital Silk Road. So many people think of Huawei, but there's also the battle for the bottom. Uh, China is uh, continuing to uh, build undersea cables as well as buying them. We've seen this happen off the coast of Sweden. So there's a lack of geopolitical thinking in Europe uh, that they hope to rectify this year with the new geopolitical commission. Um, so in 2019, we saw uh, a kind of just prior to the EU Asia sum China summit, there was a, a special EU white paper published and it uh, described China as a competitor, a partner, and a systemic rival. So it took uh, the embassy a couple of days to respond because they really weren't sure what a systemic rival was. And this language was pretty much lifted from the German BDI report. It's the Consortium of German Industry. And when uh, China lost the support of German industry, you know, it, it's very surprising because uh, Germany has very... Uh, was making a lot of money in, in China, but they had become uh, antagonized by the new rules and regulations that China had put on companies in, in China regarding uh, repatriation of funds, uh, FDI requirements, technology transfer, and also having someone from the Communist Party inside their companies. It was really unclear how they would perform, would they have to be promoted, there were many new rules and regulations. So this kind of was a barometer of the relations between Europe and China. So three descriptions all in one sentence. And so you can see how complicated the EU-China relationship is. Um, which brings us uh, more up to what's happening now. So we've seen um, with COVID 2019, uh, it kind of accelerates some of the trends that we've seen in the past. I just lost my, that's uh, okay. So uh, there's an acceleration of certain uh, uh, aspects of EU-China relations. Uh, we've seen a wolf warrior diplomacy. So first we had mask diplomacy and it, Italy was the first country in Europe that had uh, suffered uh, terribly under the COVID-19 pandemic. And they had turned to the EU for help. Uh, China was the first really to respond. The EU was very slow initially in their response. And so China used that as a way to cultivate support. Uh, Italians were very grateful. A friend in need is a friend indeed. 
and trying to try to maximize this type of narrative, almost overplaying their hand, because we saw with even Chinese officials um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they had an uh, infamous scene that they actually tweeted of Italians out on their balconies clapping to the Chinese national anthem and then spliced in very sloppily in very slow, says grazie Gina. So people almost felt um, insulted by such blatant propaganda. And even though to, from recent polls, Chinese still see uh, positive uh, views of China because they helped them when they were really in need. Later, Europe was able to uh, help them as well. Germany even took some patients from Italy and put them into German hospitals and gave them care. So, but the initial narrative was that China was there and Europe wasn't, thus also playing into the Euro skepticism. So China kind of um, fueled the, the Euro skeptic narrative. And we also saw that in accession state Serbia, a uh, possible accession state Serbia, China has a lot of investments there. Huawei is very active. And when um, Vucic, uh, the leader of Serbia met the, the plane on the tarmac, he kissed the Chinese flag, said there was no such thing as European solidarity and thank you China for saving us. So China initially was really gathering a lot of um, positive uh, news on their mask diplomacy. So mask diplomacy eventually morphed into wolf warrior diplomacy. They kind of overplayed their hand. They uh, overreached in some respects. Some of this already existed prior to COVID-19. We saw Sweden um, with the bookseller activist um, who's also a Swedish citizen. So the Chinese ambassador has said, I have a gun for my enemies and wine for my friends, meaning the, the Swedes were on their naughty list. So we see this kind of wolf warrior diplomacy even predates COVID-19, but it's accelerated very dramatically. And this has had some negative uh, ramifications. Now, Britain has left the EU, and they're probably more a uh, natural barometer of public sentiment towards China, because you have a mixed bag of 27 countries, some with Chinese investments, um, but the UK is actually having a reckoning on their relations with China, and they're a rethink on if they will accept Huawei or not. So we're seeing kind of this um, new relationship with China, a new uh, reckoning. But then the EU itself, uh, the bureaucratic arm of it, the European External Action Service, the EEAS, kind of the diplomatic arm of the EU, in the last two weeks had two own goals. For example, um, they published a disinformation report, and the two countries that they follow very closely are China and Russia. And so we've seen a, an uptick in China's propaganda across Europe. It used to be a very positive propaganda, uh, you know, telling a good China story, getting, you know, stories uh, about China out there to the European public and trying to cultivate um, their positive views. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a dramatic change. So many have said that they took uh, a paper out of the Russian playbook and uh, planted disinformation, for example, even though they carefully cultivated good relations with Italy, they actually kind of were willing to risk all of that by accusing Italy as the country where the COVID-19 really began. Teresa, this, um, this is a topic I'd like to, I'd like to pursue a little uh, more actively. Um, uh, can, we, can we talk a little bit about um, some of the, the ways in which uh, European journalists have been kind of, uh, you know, the propaganda campaign doesn't stop at, uh, at just sort of, you know, masks and and Wolf Warrior does it. There's there's some real uh, pressure being put on uh, European journalists. European journalists, and also uh, we see even Xinhua journalists kind of attacking others on Twitter. For example, I saw an exchange with a, a, a member of the European Parliament who is actually the chair of the China panel, and he was accusing him of being a poodle. So we see this poodle politics, but also a lot of pressure on European uh, journalists, for example, in reporting of Huawei, they're actually being um, controlled to some extent what they say because uh, there are some pending lawsuits about things that have been published. Uh, in regard to COVID-19, how it's published, um, I should follow up with one, one quick statement about sure. the, the uh, 27 EU ambassadors uh, based in Beijing signed a, a letter 
uh, it was an anodyne letter to uh, commemorate the 45th anniversary of EU-China relations. The, ministry, the PRC's Ministry of Foreign Affairs edited that and they took out one sentence in regard to COVID-19. So that seems to be a red line. No one can mention COVID-19. And they so, went ahead so and the published- the PRC it. Ministry of Foreign Affairs edited a letter that the, the ambassadors had collectively put together to to, to uh, celebrate, I guess, the, uh, the 45th anniversary, uh, anniversary of EU PRC relations? Yes, this just happened last Friday and it created a huge um, furore because the current uh, EU head of delegation, uh, Nicolas Chapuis, he's kind of parachuted in from the French um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, signed off on this. So one, he should have asked all the other EU members, would this be all right? You know, he should have asked the EU member states because all the ambassadors had signed it. Uh, but when the MFA said, we want to change the language, we want you to censor this sentence. Well, what uh, did the sentence say? What would, what? Uh, it was about that COVID, uh, we need cooperation on the origins of um, COVID-19, which started in Wuhan and then traveled from Wuhan to the rest of the world. Has so there been sort of investigation about the, the, the sort of initiation of, of the disease? Right. So the Europeans have called for uh, investigation. And it seems very clear now that that is a red line because Australia has had the same issue and now they're having economic coercion. Uh, the EU caved in and said, uh, okay, take it out of the letter. And in addition, the letter was supposed to be published in the People's Daily, which would have a large circulation in Chinese language within um, the PRC, but they reneged on that as well. So the, the EU self-censored in the hopes of spreading this message, which really was just anodyne, like, you know, let's cooperate, let's all be friends, kind of, um, let's work on climate change and issues like that. But it wasn't even published in the People's Daily and China Daily is an English, uh, it's published in English language and is more for an international audience. So this has created a huge furore. People have asked for the resignation of the head of the EU delegation. And uh, so he got a public ticking off. Um, the European External Action Service said he should have checked with headquarters before accepting the censorship. And mm -hmm. also that um, he still retains their support. But members of the European Parliament have asked for his uh, head. You know, they want him to resign. Mm. So we'll see how that will play out. Yeah. So we were we were talking a little bit about some of the um, the other issues uh, relating to Chinese pressure. I wanted to mention um, the case of the journalist Valerie Niquet, the French journalist. Maybe you could talk a little bit about her. Valerie Niquet is an academic. She is with uh, oh. a, a think tank in France. She's a very prominent uh, expert. She also sp speaks Japanese. Russian and Chinese, so she's you know very brilliant, very well respected, and she said something uh, in an interview about Huawei. And in, she, in Beijing or in uh, on a television program, I believe, uh, in France, if I remember ah. correctly, and they are suing her. She is being sued by Huawei for defamation, and it's still ongoing. So this has had a cascading effect. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Where is she being sued? If I understand, she's being sued in France. Yeah, okay. And um, don't I understand also that uh, defamation in France is a criminal, not a civil matter? I think you're correct on that, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, this seems to be, you know, a sort of a hardball approach to dealing with, you know, this issue of COVID-19. Uh, I, I think it's extremely worrisome because it has a cascading effect. We see many, even myself, when I wrote a paper recently, I was very cautious about you know, how I spoke about Huawei. And I imagine other academics, everyone, it has this effect of making p people wary of even going there. And I think the Huawei debate is something that is key uh, to China relations. They see that it, they're so close and that they're really pushing ahead. In addition to that, um, they're establishing facts on the ground. For example, in Germany, uh, there's a deep divide between the intelligence services who don't trust Huawei and the business leaders who feel that if they don't support Huawei, their business interests in China will be penalized. So there's almost a type of economic coercion that the PRC is using through 
uh, these countries who already have business interests inside China. So the Huawei debate, I, I think, is one of the key issues right now. The UK is rethinking it, and Germany, as we speak, you know, the, their Vodafone, which is Huawei's partner in Germany, and they have all have worked together for several years. They're building infrastructure facts on the ground. So even though the Bundestag, the German Parliament, has not come up with a final decision things are moving ahead anyway. So they're establishing real economic facts on the ground. You know, if we turn to, to human rights for a minute, there's, a, there's sort of a perception that the Europeans have been somewhat quiet on a lot of the human rights issues. Um, why, why is that the case? It, 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 well, first of all, is it accurate? Second of all, um, if it's not accurate, um, I mean, if it is accurate, why, why is it that the Europeans have been so, so quiet on these issues with China? Um, that, no, that's a very good question. Europe is not a monolith. So, for example, some, a country like Sweden has been vocal and they've paid a price for that. Uh, but I would say that at the EU institutional level, we even saw, for example, Federica Mogherini, the previous high rep vice president of the European uh, Union. She uh, would never, even if it had her name on it, if there was a statement that the EEAS had issued, the European External Action Service, she refused to tweet it. So she would tweet other statements on other issues, but when it came to China, she self-censored and never tweeted it. So I asked one of, you know, I brought this up at an event and I was told that she was planning a trip to China, so therefore she wasn't going to do that. And then after her trip to China, I carefully looked at her Twitter account and she still was not tweeting anything like that. So mm -hmm. it has this kind of also when we see a high level EU official self-censoring, I, I think that sends a very worrisome mes message. Um, the EU member states like to have a positive agenda with China. So in regard to um, negotiation of trade, they let the EU uh, handle human rights dialogue. So they used to have these human rights dialogue that would take care of all the EU member states at the EU level. So Brussels was kind of in charge of that and they would do it two times a year. That has been in fits and starts. China uh, has canceled many of the meetings and it probably meets only once a year and with great reluctance. Mm -hmm. So it's handy for EU member states to say, okay, they don't have to have a bilateral on human rights. So they let Brussels kind of carry the dirty laundry for them. And that gets them off the China's um, the, the difficult discussion on human rights. But I think it also is very depressing. I, I saw, for example, Angela Merkel. Well, uh, well, well, let's not leave that though first, right? Because we, uh, if, if we could focus for a second on, on this question about if, if individual member states are sort of punting the issue up to the EU, but then the EU's interests are sufficiently divided that there isn't a uniform statement coming out of the EU. Um, so so what, what's the dynamic? How does China play in that dynamic? All right, so there were two examples last year. Uh, or, no, 2017 was the first time we saw the EU unable to get unanimity to come up with a statement that they would make annually in Geneva on human rights. And so that was blocked by your typical um, Greece. And um, later the same year, uh, a letter uh, protesting against the arrest of human rights lawyers inside China was blocked by Hungary. So I think 2017, we saw it was very clear that the EU could no longer even make statements on human rights issues in regard to China. And uh, we see people prefer to sign business deals. And Angela Merkel, I've, I'm told uh, the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, when she goes to China, she says, uh, I've been told people say that she speaks to them privately about human rights issues, but does that really resonate with the rest of the world? So she did make a statement on Hong Kong when she was in Beijing, but she did not mention Xinjiang. And then a few weeks later, she was followed by the French leader Macron, who went to, to Beijing, same thing. He signed business deals, no mention of Xinjiang, and I don't even think he mentioned Hong Kong. So I think that uh, this kind of positive agenda that these countries have, they, they see the highest value is signing these deals. And I think that Europe, who, which was traditionally very active in regard to human rights and had you know, some weight on that, we've seen that erode. Uh, Chinese interests have eroded European values in that area.
Well, this is a really interesting um, topic. I, I, I want to explore this in some depth, but um, first let's talk a little bit about the EU itself. Um, it's a, it's a consensus driven organization, am I right? And so, and so uh, that reminds me very much of, uh, uh, of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, right? So it's a consensus organization. And, and um, it, unless, unless all the members of ASEAN are, um, are in agreement on a particular statement, then the statement can't be issued. I, I assume that that's the same thing with the EU and, and that works in China's favor? Yes. So China with um, this group that I mentioned, the 16 plus one, later known as the 17 plus one, the investments they made there have actually created a wedge strategy. So they're able to call on these member states and it's no fun to be the, the, one, the one member state always holding out. So there are a few of them that can say, oh, we all disagree. So they're not lonely anymore. There's not so much pressure. If there are two or three member states which will support the Chinese position, it's easier for them to hold out as well because if you're the only member state, you know, others will lobby you and try to trade with you, you know, try to do some trade-offs with you. So the more countries China can pull into its orbit, the, the more they're able to block the EU. So in my view, they've been effectively neutralized since 2016 in regard to any heavy lifting in regard to China. So we saw, for example, last year with the FDI um, Foreign Direct Investment Screening Mechanism. Now the US has CFIUS and Europe even today, only half the EU member states actually have a national um, screening mechanism. So this is actually quite worrisome. We saw you know, China increase their investments across Europe and three countries, Germany, France, and Italy had uh, promoted this screening mechanism. So for European standards, it went very quickly. They got it done within about a year and a, and a half. And, but the problem is that it doesn't have teeth and it doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. And so uh, I've been told by others that China was able to use their proxies to help water the statement down. But from an EU point of view, at least they have that. So they think we've got that established and over time we can tighten it up. And it, there's nothing to stop EU member states to make their own national legislation more tight. So Germany, of course, has come up with tighter legislation because they're fearful of a post-COVID-19 landscape that China will come in again and buy the high-tech industries that they, they really value. So it's up to EU member states and some are increasingly uh, drafting their own FDI screening mechanisms. But I, I would like to see all of the EU member states have some sort of screening mechanism. So um, you mentioned earlier, uh, speaking of, you know, of, of the acquisitions of companies, that uh, 2016 was kind of a watershed year uh, when, when you know, sort of the, I think um, you, you put it that the, the <laughs> okay. um, I, I guess we're back in recording. So um, <laughs> that the, so, so, so it seems like 2016 was a watershed year in the sense that um, that was the year that uh, the, the Chinese, uh, a, a Chinese firm bought KUKA, the German uh, robotics uh, firm. You mentioned that earlier. And that sort of triggered in my mind that um, 2016 really was, uh, was kind of a watershed year for other reasons as well, right? I mean, that, that's the, the year that, um, that the South China Sea arbitration decision was issued uh, and, um, you know, I think kind of in keeping with some of the things you've been talking about, about the uh, relatively weak, um, uh, you know, EU statements on human rights issues, um, uh, that, that there was a, a fairly um, anticlimactic uh, response to the, the uh, arbitration decision in, uh, in Europe, especially for you know, I mean, Europe is the, the, the champion of, um, of liberalism and, and, and the rules-based order. And, uh, and so I, it, it was, I think on this side of the Atlantic, something of a surprise um, that uh, there was such a tepid response to the, uh, to, to the arbitration statement. Um, uh, so 2016 was a big year. I, I lost to it there. And the, um, what response? I'm sorry. Why was there such a tepid response? Sorry, did uh, I cut out? Um, you cut out a little bit. Um, the question: so Why was the there such a tepid response? I think the Chinese had were extremely concerned about this, and they were lobbying to a great extent to get support from EU member states. So the three states that uh, watered down or 
blocked the statement. One was Croatia, and Croatia didn't really have, they had a, a maritime dispute with Slovenia. So they had their own personal reasons not to support yeah. the arbitral tribunal statement. But the other two countries were Hungary and Greece. So Greece has received a great deal of investment from China in regard to the Piraeus port. And then Hungary uh, is one of the keynotes on this 17 plus one uh, land sea corridor. And even um, they, ha they have effectively blocked the statement. And then when the EU speaks, they're supposed to speak with one voice, but to a very unusual extent, Hungary released their own statement about the arbitral tribunal decision. And some analysts joked that it looked like a translation from a Chinese speaking point. So uh, Hungary has been extremely helpful uh, to the Chinese. And in fact, if you look at the investment figures uh, into Hungary, they're not that extraordinary, but a little bit of money goes actually a long way in Hungary. And then there's this idea of, you know, China as a new face. So when a member state, an EU member state is unhappy with Brussels, they, they can't really turn to Russia, but they can turn to China because China is considered far away and people aren't really that familiar with China. So it's another card to play and it's a way to say, to, to signal to Brussels, we're unhappy with you and we've got other options, we can turn to China. And so China, you know, welcomed this. Now we see with the recent Freedom House report, Hungary is, you know, not even considered a, a democracy anymore. And it's an EU member state. So largely this is done because of Chinese investments and we see, you know, very worrisome actions. So um, I, I would call this the, the point where the European dream and the China dream collide. So we see Europe, it's really having an existential crisis because of this type of Chinese influence that they're able to uh, impose in this region. So I've got a, um, I'm gonna to turn to a few of the, the audience questions at this point. I've got a hundred questions, but um, we'll, we'll turn to a few of the audience ones. So Frank Hong is asking about Made in China 2025. The US is officially opposed to it. What about the EU? Um, I think made it all right. I think it's natural for any country to want to move up the value added chain. But I think that with the announcement of the Made in China 2025 program, it really changed the, the dynamics because Germany always saw themselves as a few steps ahead of China, that China was a great customer, that German industry was growing, and they had a healthy trade relationship with China. But when they saw that they were actually selling robotics company. It was like selling the goose that laid the golden egg. And they weren't just buying, you know, a second or third tier level. They were buying the very, very best robotics company in Germany. Mm. So I think the intelligence uh, as well was concerned. They noticed that a steep decline in um, China hacking. So they were trying to figure out why. And they, they learned that, well, because China just bought all the companies that they wanted. <laughs> so they no longer needed to hack all these uh, companies. So right. I think that- Hack <laughs> yourself. I think that, you know, so they, they called it, um, the head mm -hmm. of uh, uh, German intelligence called it the boiling frog syndrome. So, you know, they mm -hmm. started having business deals and then it just kept going. And they, like the frog that's starting to be boiled, they were unable to jump out of the pot. So they, they felt it was a, a real warning sign. And now we even see uh, that China, uh, Germany has established a special fund to actually block possible Chinese investment post COVID-19. So they're, they're preparing themselves for what they're expecting, a huge Chinese uh, sale of the century type of thing. 